and he's going to talk about zeros of linear combinations of characteristic polynomials from SUN. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for the organizers for inviting me here. This is my first time in Brazil, my first time in, in, uh, in South America in this continent, so obligato. I think this is my first time on YouTube, so for you guys, obligato as well. Um, uh, so uh, what do we know? So we know that typically an L function is defined by various axioms. It's one way of doing things. It should have a Dirichlet series. It should have an Euler product. It should have a functional equation, and it should have some analytic continuation. And if it satisfies those axioms, which were made more precise by Selberg, written down very precisely, then we expect it to have a Riemann hypothesis. And all of the critical zeros of such an L function will lie on a particular line. And if you follow Selberg's uh, way of axiomatizing, that line has real part of s equals one half. What I want to talk about is where you take two L functions and add them. Now, in some cases, this will preserve a Dirichlet series. That's fine. It will preserve functional equations. That's fine. But what it might not do is preserve the Euler product. The arithmetic is destroyed. And so you can't expect all the zeros to lie on the critical line. And this is very much like the last talk, where we had something that had a Dirichlet series, it had a functional, uh, functional equation, analytic continuation, but it didn't have an Euler product. And the question there was, well, where are the zeros? So you don't expect them all to lie on the line. But what Bombieri and Hedgehal showed was that if you have choose two L functions which have the same functional equation, then amazingly, 100% asymptotically, of the zeros lie on the critical line. And this is certainly not the case if the functional equation is, uh, is uh, are, are different. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time explaining why that is true. But it's not my result. Uh, uh, and so I'm going to go and do a random matrix version of it. And I was asked to do this by somebody who was uh, wanted, you know, said, do something in random matrix theory, surely it will be easier, so surely the proof will be more, uh, give, give more illumination. It was most grumpy with me when it turned out to be more complicated. Now, I'll explain a little bit about why the random matrix theory is harder than the number theory in some sense. There's more d technical complications to overcome. What was the motivation for doing this? One motivation is, is uh, studying epstein zeta functions where you can write these things as linear combinations of L functions. So I have some dates down here. So both of these were done by Bombieri and Hedgehal. The general case uh, in uh, uh, 1995, but the Epstein case earlier in 1987 was their first paper doing this, and they showed 100%. Yes, Jeff. Oh, I am. I'm going to, there you go. <coughs> That's their, uh, so yes, absolutely. So you assume RH, or GRH, and you also need to assume something else about the zeros that's not yet known but very widely believed, that the zeros don't clump together too much. That ruins their proof if they do, do clump up. Um, so here's a statement that they proved in, in 1995. Uh, so you take L functions. They have the same functional equation. That is crucial. You make a linear combination of them and 100% of the zeros asymptotically lie on the critical line under RH. Do some of them lie off? Some of them lie off. Absolutely, definitely, some of them lie off. Uh, so I think the first international conference I went to was at MSRI back in 1999, and Hedgehal and Selberg both spoke at that conference, and they both spoke on results like this. So um, Hedgehal spoke about zeros lying off the line. and was trying to count uh, the number that lay off. And Selberg was speaking about zeros that lay on the line of linear combinations, but he didn't want to have any, any, uh, any hypothesis. He had no GRH and he had no, uh, no clumping assumptions. And what could you say then? And I'm not going to talk about that. So what assumption did they need? So GRH, as Jeff said, is absolutely crucial. Um, and the other assumption is this following one at the bottom here. Now what this is counting 
is the number of zeros, pairs of zeros, that are closer together than one would expect. Epsilon here is arbitrarily small. And they don't want to have too many of these clumps. And so that's their additional hypothesis. And uh, as is well known from those who attended the school or those who have sat through talks on random matrix theory before, the zeros of L functions are modeled by eigenvalues of random unitary matrices. And this is Odlisko's famous picture. And Keating and Snaith took that philosophy and idea and showed that one could model the values of L functions by characteristic polynomials of random unitary matrices. And there's a whole slew of uh, uh, reasons that I'm not going to talk about proof by pictures. The red here is Riemann zeta. The green here is uh, random matrix theory. The black is what everything converges to, the central limit theorem. And you can see that the fit is very, very good. So proof by pictures. So therefore, one can ask the same, oh, uh, 42 matrices and 10 to, the, 10 to the 20, I think, was the, the 10 to the 20th zero. So whatever corresponds with 42. So they do converge. It's a theorem for both of them that as n tends to infinity and as t tends to infinity, when you do the right thing, you will get a Gaussian distribution. Uh, but the point of this picture, which I don't really want to talk about too much, the point of this picture is the fit is far better than just, well, they're the same in the limit. Because everything converges to the central limit theorem, sort of. Um, but it's much better than that. <clears throat> so characteristic polynomials are a good model for values of the Riemann zeta function and for other L functions in the T aspect. So can you do the same sort of calculation that Bombieri and Hedgehow did for linear combinations of L functions for linear combinations of random matrices. And you can. So this is a paper that I did with, uh, or this is a result that I found with uh, Yassine Bahoumi and uh, Joseph Najnudel and Ashkan Nechabali, and it came out in March this year. And it, it, it's, it's exactly the equivalent. So you take a linear combination of characteristic polynomials. I need them to have the same functional equation. And that turns out to requiring the matrix to have the same determinant and because of rotation and variance, I'm just going to say, right, you've got determinant one. That's why we're from SUN rather than UN now. And then the expected proportion of zeros of that new polynomial that lie on the uh, unit circle, which, as we will see, will be the equivalent to the critical line, converges to one as the matrix size tends to infinity. And my method of proof is going to be very similar to the method of proof of Bombieri and Hedgehog. So let me put this into some context and give this some further motivation. So if we have a, a, a characteristic polynomial of a unitary matrix, we will see later, but you might already know this, that it's a self-inversive polynomial. So I can actually turn this into a, after a slight change of variables, into a real trigonometric polynomial. Now, if I add two characteristic polynomials, then that self-inversiveness is destroyed if they don't have the same determinant. And one, therefore, you, don't, you aren't going to get a real trigonometric polynomial. And in fact, you aren't going to have zeros lying on the unit circle, typically. They will cluster around the unit circle. That's a very generic feature of random polynomials. But they won't lie on the unit circle. A further motivation for considering these types of questions is by uh, 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 Bogomolny, uh, uh, Bohigas, and Lebif, who, motivated by questions of mathematical physics, particularly trying to understand some problems that arise in semi-classical approximation of quantum systems, they studied uh, self-inversive polynomials or trigonometric, yeah, self-inversive polynomials, where the first half of the coefficients are chosen from the, uh, with Gaussian distribution independently. And then the second half are fixed by the self-inversiveness. And they showed that one over, uh, square root of a third of the zeros lie on the unit circle. Pictures. So this is where I've done the first thing. I've just taken two random unitary matrices 
found their characteristic polynomials, added them, plotted the zeros. You can see that they cluster around the unit circle, as they should. But in fact, none of them lie on the unit circle. None of them have absolute value equal to 1. And then I've taken a uh, self-inversive polynomial, so I chose the first half of the coefficients, IID Gaussian. Second half get fixed by the self-inversive property. I found those zeros, and I plotted a picture, and 28 of those zeros are on the circle or a for a 50 by 50 matrix. And expected numbers 28.87. I, 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 so I did about three or four experiments before I fixed on this picture, and I didn't choose it because it had 28 zeros on, which is very close to here. What I found, and I, I, I haven't understood this because I was just playing around last night, is that quite a few of these pictures have zeros that are rather far away from the unit circle. So a zero down here, which actually means there'll be a zero close to the origin. Uh, and so this is the first one that actually gave a decent picture. So this is about the fourth experiment I tried. And there might be something there, or it might just be there's nothing. Last picture. So this is now what I want to talk about. Here I've taken a random unitary matrix with determinant 1. And then I've taken another random unitary matrix with determinant 1, found the characteristic polynomials, added them together, found the zeros of that polynomial and plotted that. And all bar four of them lie exactly on the unit circle. And this was the first experiment I did. I didn't do any fiddling around here. But I did do some more calculation. And I wondered how many lie off the circle. So I'm going to come onto this at the very end with no answer. Uh, but here's just some numerics. So I did lots and lots of experiments, and I worked out how many zeros lie on and off. And so uh, what's that? That's zero. So everything lies on. Two zeros lie off. So it looks like four or six zeros off seems to be the most popular uh, outcome for 50 by 50 matrices sampled 10,000 times. I don't know what the actual limiting distribution of this is. That's work that is still to be done. And I'll come on to that at the very last slide. There's an awfully large number of questions I don't know the answer to. So let me give you an idea of how do you prove these sorts of results. And first, I'm going to do this for the L function side of things. So let L be a, an L function. So what do we know about it? We know it has a functional equation of a particular type. It's one of the axioms of Selberg. And I don't care what that type is, but we know it has a functional equation like that. And I can write the functional equation as follows, like this. G of s, L of s is g bar, 1 minus s, L bar, 1 minus s. So I'm not assuming L is real or anything like that. It takes s to 1 minus s. And as I said, this was Selberg's choice of normalization that ensures the critical line has real part of s equals 1 half. Apologies to those who love elliptic curves. What this means, the way I've done this, ensures that g times l is real on the critical line. And you can do this for any l function. But this means I can find the zeros by counting sign changes. And as all the numerical people in the room here will tell us, that is how you find zeros, typically. You count sign changes of a real function. Now, if we have the same functional equation, the functional equation is the thing that determines g, if we have the same functional equation, L1 and L2 both have the same functional equation, they both have the same g, then any linear combination of them, if I just take, so I want to understand the zeros of this linear combination, this is a complex function, a and B are just real numbers. L1, L2 are L functions. I multiply them by the G, which is the same G by assumption. And then this function F is real along the critical line. So I can count zeros by counting sign changes. And I couldn't, yes. Yes. And I couldn't, the question was, are we assuming A and B are real? And we are. And we couldn't do this. Um, uh, th 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 this having a real f, and hence being able to count sign changes, if I didn't have the same functional equation. 
There we go. So we can find the zeros of the linear combination by finding sine tangent of x. So how do I do that? Or how did they do that? This is their idea, carrier waves. Now then, we know that for any L function, log L is normally distributed with a variance that grows. Grows like log log t, typically. The constant in front of it depends on the particular type of L function. I don't care about that. The point is it's growing with t. So if we think about that, if we have some small window over the critical line, typically one L function will be much bigger than all the others in the linear combination. And I'm going to call that one L function the carrier wave. And who's the carrier wave at each particular point will change. But over a small subset of the window, one L function will, look, will dominate the rest. Now, its zeros, if they are well spaced, which remember was one of the assumptions that they needed, will sort of drag along the zeros of the linear combination because it's dominating. So it's much bigger up here and it's much bigger down here. So all the noise that the other bits pull in get lost and the, w the zero of the linear combination will change slightly, but it will be, morally speaking, the zero of this one L function. As Jeff pointed out, I had to approve the, uh, assume the Riemann hypothesis. That lies on the line, and therefore, we get a sign change for the combination. Okay. So more pictures. So I'm now moving into the random matrix case, but this is the same argument as for the L function case. So what I've got here is one characteristic polynomial chosen at random from the unit, uh, 30 by 30 unitary matrix with determinant one. And I've plotted the real version of the characteristic polynomial there. And then I overlay that with another independently chosen choice. And now I'm going to add these two characteristic polynomials, and we get this. Now, there's quite a lot of data to take in, so let me just zoom in. This is between 0 and 2 pi. I'll zoom in between 0 and 2, and that's this picture here. It's the same picture. I've just zoomed in slightly to show some of the features. Feature number one. So notice that the red, carrier, the red characteristic polynomial is bigger over this bit of the window, between, what, 0 and sort of 1-ish. That's the carrier wave. That's bigger, and it's pulling along the linear combination. And so the zeros are pretty much the zeros of the first polynomial. But it doesn't stay the carrier wave forever. What happens now is it happens to be the green characteristic polynomial that becomes bigger than the red one. So it becomes the carrier wave. But that's okay because it also has zeros on the, the line. I've normalized it so that this is the unit circle I've turned into the line. And so the linear combination is now following the zeros of the green carrier wave. So if you whoops, zoom in here, we can see a case where things work. So this is, you can just see it, that little blue circle. I've just zoomed into that. The red is smaller than the green. The black being the combination of the two is following closely to the green thing. And so the zero of the black is exactly, you know, close to the zero of the green exactly as it should be. And I've also got a case where things don't work, and that's here, where the two L functions, the two characteristic polynomials, sorry, they, 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 they cancel each other out. There's not one that's a dominating characteristic polynomial, and I've lost a zero, a zero is destroyed. And again, this was not, this was the first example that I chose. I've not done any fiddling to get this to work here. This is typical behavior. So how can we develop this idea into proving things within random matrix theory? How can we take this idea of carrier waves, which was due, as I said, to Bombieri and Hedgehell, or developed by them, and make it work for random matrices? What problems do we uh, encounter? Okay, so not all characteristic polynomials are normally distributed. Almost all of them are, but not all of them are. So we have to be careful with that. We have to take that into account. Not all unitary matrices have well-spaced zeros. Almost all of them do, 
but not all of them. The identity matrix has its zeros all plonked in the same place. Now, it's very, very rare to be identity when you're picking things from the unitary case, but I've got to take account of it. So I have to take account of these things that just simply don't happen in the number theory case. So what we need to do is we need to show that sort of all this bad structure in SUN actually has very small measure. And all this bad structure between 0 and 2 pi also has very small measure. And it's sort of trying to tackle these, you know, separate bits of randomness that caused all this extra technical issues. So some more details. Let's see the functional equation. Now, for many of you, this might be um, um, very old hat. So here's the characteristic polynomial uh, as I think it was John who said, this is a, an, an unusual way of writing it, but it's what works for us. Uh, so Z is, so unitary matrix, eigenvalues on the unit circle. So if Z is an eigenvalue, then you're going to have vanishing here. So I mean, it does exactly what you want it to do. And what you can do is we can factor out all these e to the i theta n's, and the product of those is the determinant of u star. We can factor out a bunch of z's, and I'm just left with a 1 over z here, and I get a z to the n outside. And if I stare at this, I see that this is actually the characteristic polynomial not of u, but of u star, and not of z, but of 1 over z. And so if I define a uh, function bar as f of z bar all bar, then I have that there's a functional equation taking the characteristic polynomial for u evaluated at z, it gets multiplied by some factor that's going to act like g, g squared in fact, that we saw previously, times the characteristic polynomial of the, with the complex conjugate of 1 over z. Now, if I choose my matrix to come from S u n, then the determinant of this matrix becomes 1. S u n isn't important, by the way, because by rotation symmetry, I can have any, uh, you know, e to the i theta for any theta, uh, but 1 is the nicest value, so I'm going to use S u n, uh, but there really is nothing special about S u n here. So this is 1, so g is you just look at this, I'm just going to take the square root of this stuff, replacing debt by 1, but it doesn't depend upon the matrix chosen. This is coming back to requiring the same functional equation. And so we can take, there we, oops, so here we go. So g times lambda is g bar 1 over z times lambda 1 over z, and this is an exact analogy to what we had for L functions. So let's make the analogy explicit. The critical line for L functions becomes the unit circle. The right of the critical strip, that's where S tends to infinity, becomes the unit disk. Why is that? Because within this normalization, the center of the critical strip has the value 1 for the characteristic polynomial. And if I go all the way to the right of the critical line, critical, um, uh, the complex plane, my zeta function tends to 1. So that's the right analogy to take. And as I have already said, g times lambda is a real function on the unit circle. Because just look at what we've got here. If I plug in z equals e to the i theta, I have a function equals the function complex conjugate. Therefore, the function must be real. OK, linear combinations. So we're going to take these things, draw them independently from s u n. So A and B are real. This is the linear combination. Multiply it by this function G. So F is now real. This is an exact analogy to what we did before. F is real. And so the zeros of my linear combination, the thing that I wish to calculate, the thing that I wish to bound, to estimate, these can be found by sign changes of F of theta. So let's go and find sign changes. OK. So the proof breaks, it breaks into two things. Um, and I'm going far quicker than I thought I would. Uh, so I, I was not actually planning to give too many technical details. 
Okay, so there's two crucial parts to this. The first part is to show that with very high probability, probability over SUN, one characteristic polynomial dominates the other one. And I'm not saying that one dominates for all the time, but I'm saying at in sub-interval, there's one characteristic polynomial that will typically be bigger than the other. So then, let's do this slightly more precisely. So I want to have delta. It's a function of n only, and it tends to zero. What we show is that with uh, probability pretty darn close to one, I can find, so the probability is attached to the matrix. Then I find a subset of 0 to 2 pi. That's the measure attached to theta. So that there's very small measure on the theta. This is a random set. Now, it depends upon my two matrices. That the difference between them is smaller than delta times square root log n. So for typical matrices, for almost all of theta, the gap between one matrix and the one characteristic polynomial and the other is large, delta times square root log n. So I hadn't intended to explain this, but I have got a little bit of time. So how do we do this? So first of all, we have to deal with harm measure on SUN. Well, that's okay because we, A, we know what harm measure on SUN is, but also you can... Um, uh, collapse it into sort of an integral over theta. Uh, I'm getting this the wrong way around. Sorry. You can take the harm measure on un, and you can write that as an integral over theta times harm measure on sun. I want to work out this difference here, so I've got various tools and techniques from probability theory, Chebyshev's theorem and Markov's inequality that I can apply and turn questions of this nature, what is the probability that for a theta, this is uh, bigger than this number, or smaller than this number, depending on which way I wish to calculate things, and I can estimate that probability in terms of expectations. It's an expectation both over theta and over the unitary matrices. The expectation over theta is an integral over theta, the expectation over unitary matrices is the expectation over SUN with Haar measure. Those two combine nicely to get me an expectation over UN of the moments of the characteristic polynomials. Two independent characteristic polynomials at a particular value of theta. Keating and Snaith worked out those moments. So I've got that, but I first need to condition on one particular value of the unitary matrix. I do some conditioning arguments with improbability. I then take the work of Keating and Snaith and their moment generating function and approximate that. And then we average over the conditioning and we just work all the way through. Details are in the paper and really aren't that illuminating or interesting and you end up with this answer here. So that's what we had to do. So Approximation calculations from probability theory, Chebyshev, Markov. Evaluating expectations over SUN and over the, the theta. Writing those in terms of expectations over UN using previous results obtained by Keating and Snaith and then evaluating that asymptotically to get the right approximation for delta. That's the first step. So this has told us that for almost all theta, typically, one characteristic polynomial is much bigger than the other. This still isn't enough. We need another idea. Because what we need to do is show that the characteristic polynomials don't wibble around too much. See, it might be that one is big, and then very quickly, the other one gets big. And this argument wouldn't work. What we now need to do is show that with very high probability, there is on a decent sub-interval of zero theta, there is actually one characteristic polynomial and the dominant one remains persistently dominant. So we can track its zeros. And that's this next result. So with very high probability, 
well, yeah, this, this, this first bit here is basically saying that the they don't change too quickly. So over a subinterval that's in some sense large, it contains asymptotically many zeros, but in some sense is small. It's much smaller than 1 over 2 to the, uh, 1 over 2, smaller than a constant. One carrier wave remains dominant. This is sort of the persistence thing. And since that's dominant in the interval, what that's saying is that, so now I'm going to concentrate on this subinterval, and then over a large proportion of this subinterval, there'll only be small little bits of it where the dominant switches. Now, when would those be? Those would be when my dominant characteristic polynomial actually goes through a zero, which it must do. And then the others are going to become the, 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 the they'll dominate. But I don't care about that because I'm going to be big up here and small down here. So, sure, I'm going to go through zero, but I'm going to have a sign change because I'm the dominating characteristic polynomial. And so I can calculate sign changes by finding out, by, by the next part of this theorem, is to show that over a typical subinterval where there is one characteristic polynomial that dominates, typically its zeros are sufficiently well spaced that I genuinely can have, I'm positive, then I'm negative, there's a sign change, then I'm positive, there's another sign change. So I can calculate these. So not exactly the zeros of the dominating characteristic polynomial, but they're pretty darn close. So I can get a lower bound on the number of zeros, the sign changes of f of theta, simply by finding the number of zeros of, this, of the, the dominating characteristic polynomial. And then the part of the technical proof is trying to keep track of where this goes wrong and how this can go wrong. Okay, so if the subinterval is sufficiently large, I've got many zeros, and then I move from that subinterval to the next one. I've changed my carrier wave, but I've still got random matrix theory for my zero distribution, and I simply lower bound over all of these things. And then the end of the proof is you just add everything up, and all the error terms nicely cancel, and you end up with the result. So a lower bound on the number of zeros down by this sign changing argument with very high probability is n minus little o of n. That's what this theorem will tell us. And since this is a degree n polynomial, I've got 100% asymptotically lying on the unit circle. So how can we take this further? Um, there are many questions which remain unanswered. So, for example, so I'm actually going to write these questions for L functions, but the same questions lie for in, within random matrix series. So, what's the distribution of the zeros that lie on the, ca the critical line? Don't fall into the trap of saying it's random matrix theory, because it might not be. Why? So these are close to the zeros of an L function that has random matrix statistics. But I have chosen that L function to be the dominating L function. So actually, it's special in that subinterval. What effect does that have on the zeros? I don't know. How many zeros lie off the critical line? Going back to the talks at MSRI, uh, uh, Hedgehell made a conjecture that it should be log, uh, t log t, that's the number you expect, divided by square root log log t. And there were some theorems in his talk as well, and Selberg had some theorems in his talk too. What we managed to get is uh, the error term is smaller than n over log n to the 1 over 22, which is not quite 1 half, but we weren't doing any effort at optimizing. So can we get a decent count, an asymptotic count, of the number of zeros that lie off the unit circle or off the critical line? I don't know, and I think that's actually quite hard. Even harder, what's the distribution of the zeros that lie off? So... Uh, um, maybe I've got an asymptotic count, or maybe there's some distribution. Maybe it fluctuates around things. Can I find its mean? That's the question I've just asked. Its variance? I've got no idea if that even makes sense. Indeed, going back to Hedgehouse talk from MSRI, 
He's not sure if it makes sense. He thinks possibly that some parts of this are pretty chaotic as you get very close to the critical line, and maybe there's a distribution as you're far away from the critical line, which is actually bringing us into this thing. What's the distribution of the distance from the critical line? Can you say anything interesting here? We suspect they're going to cluster pretty close, but could there be zeros that lie far away? How far away? They can't go arbitrarily far away. There's an elementary proof that there's got to be some abscissa for which all zeros lie to the left of that. What can we say about the zeros that lie near but off the critical line? And finally, going back to the work of uh, Bogomolny and Bohigas and Leboeuf, what happens if we take a growing number of characteristic polynomials? At the moment, I just showed this for, for n equals 2, but of course, the not of course, it turns out that the proof works for an arbitrary fixed number of characteristic polynomials. But if I allowed that fixed number to grow, what would happen? So I'd have a whole bunch of characteristic polynomials, all of degree n, growing number, and then I look at the coefficients of the, the linear combination. Now, these coefficients would therefore just be linear combinations of secular coefficients. That's the central limit theorem. So I'm going to get Gaussian, as my, if my number of com linear combinations grows, I'm going to have a Gaussian sequence of coefficients, which means I expect to see, as my linear combination grows in number, I expect to see more zeros come off and only have 1 over square root of 3 zeros on. Can we model that transition? I don't know. Well, in good time, I will finish. There is good news. When I was last in the coffee room, there were tens and tens of boxes of cake. So I'm going to finish now, and we can go and eat cake. Thank you, Chris, for a typically delightful talk. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs>